And our subject is the case for pre-tribulationalism. And I guess you can call this part one. Uh, we're going to have about four uh, messages related to this whole subject. And uh, let's read the scripture first. It says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Will you join me, please, in prayer? Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that you'd make it clear to us from your word, these wonderful prophetic events, that we would be ready and we'd know the certainty of those things that we have studied and read in your word. Thank you for what you're going to do in our hearts. In the wonderful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Now, the subject of pre-tribulationalism is under a lot of attack. It's a very controversial subject. Uh, I like what my grandkid says. It's a big word, Papa. Pre-tribulationalism. Well, what it means is that we think the rapture of the church described in 1 Thessalonians 4 is going to occur before the tribulation period, the period known as the day of the Lord, described in chapter 5, verse 2, before it ever comes. We believe the Bible is very clear on this. So if someone asked you, what is pre-tribulationalism? Uh, well, it's the belief that Jesus Christ will return before the day of the Lord known as the Tribulation, a period that we believe is a total of seven years, and will remove the entire church from earth to heaven before that period ever starts. Now, to begin with, uh, we need to understand that there are views about this among Bible teachers that are very much different from each other. For an example, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. There is not a whole lot of agreement among Christians. Now, those who truly know the Lord are all agreed that the Lord is going to come again. But the timing and how this happens and whether or not the church is removed from the earth before the tribulation, those are big subjects. In fact, Christians can really argue pretty heavily about them. It's important to be a little soft here because there are good people that disagree. But I hope to show you before we're through in this series of messages that the Bible is pretty clear, a lot more than people have said, about when the event of the rapture of the church occurs. Now, what are those views about the second coming? Well, here's an example in Revelation 20, uh, verse 4. 
says, I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ, with Messiah, a thousand years. But the rest of the dead, presumably unbelievers, live not again until the thousand years were finished. Now this, referring back to what he's talking about, verse 4, is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death, which is described at the end of this chapter as the lake of fire, hell, hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, Messiah, and shall reign with Him a thousand years. And when the thousand years are expired, then Satan's going to be loosed out of his prison. God's going to judge him. Then comes the great white throne and uh, the eternal state. Now, we have here uh, one of the first uh, issues that we must deal with when we talk about the second coming. I believe that this passage is to be taken literally. That is, I believe there's going to be a thousand year reign of the Messiah on the earth. I also take literally that believers are going to be resurrected before that thousand years begin. And I also believe that unbelievers will be resurrected after the thousand years are completed. Exactly like it says. There's a first resurrection of all believers There's a second resurrection of all non-believers. I take this literally. However, you might be surprised to know that the majority of Christians in our world do not take it literally. In fact, there's a number of speakers on the Christian radio broadcast right here in this town who do not take it literally. You may not even know they believe this. You may enjoy their ministry, and well, you should. But understand, there's a lot of disagreement. Now, we believe from Daniel chapter 9 that this tribulational period is a period of seven, either seven days, seven months, seven weeks, seven years. We think the most likely explanation is seven years because of some teaching that's found in the book of Revelation, which takes the same period of time and divides it into two. And it says that one is 42 months and 1260 days. Uh, like the other that is equal to it. So if you add both those together, you've got a seven-year period of time. A prophetic year is apparently at 360 days. It's kind of interesting. So we have this period known as the Day of the Lord, a tribulation period. Hey, it's not a fun day. It's not a day of blessing. If you want a good Bible study, you take the Day of the Lord on your trusty computer Bible program or in a concordance and look up every passage and see what you find out. The Day of the Lord has no blessing attached to it at all. Yet some of these other groups think it does. They think it refers to the second coming as well as to the blessings that will follow. But no, there's not one passage that refers to that. The Day of the Lord is a day of darkness and gloom and judgment and wrath. It's the most terrible day to ever hit planet Earth. There'll be a holocaust of terror and panic on the earth such as the world has never seen. We call it the Great Tribulation. Some say it only refers to the last half of the Tribulation. Uh, That's a possibility. But I think the whole period is under discussion because Revelation teaches that the Day of the Lord is divided into two sections. Again, 42 months each or 1260 days each. The rapture of the church, the second coming, will come before the tribulation begins. That there are no signs that need to be uh, revealed or fulfilled. That any moment now, Jesus could come for His church and catch us up to beat with Him in the air. That happens to be my belief. And uh, you'll find out when you get to heaven that I'm right. But anyway, pre-tribulationalism is one belief. In other words, we believe Christ comes for His church before the tribulation. We also agree with the post-tribs that He comes to the earth at the end of the tribulation. Turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. There are many people who believe that we're going to be continuing through the first three and a half years of the tribulation as the Antichrist will be rising to power and the peace agreement with Israel. And of course, things that are happening now make folks think this very strongly. 
And it's a possible view. In Revelation 11, we have a story about two witnesses, I think are Moses and Elijah, who come back. They, were, after all, were the ones that appeared with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. They might also be the two witnesses that were at the resurrection. They might also be the two who were at the ascension. It's possible the same two guys, which would be interesting, really. Uh, you say, are you sure about that? No, I'm not. Well, why are you saying it? Well, just get you to study, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> now, these two witnesses, according to Revelation 11, are killed. And their dead bodies lie in the street of the great city where our Lord was crucified, which is Jerusalem. But interesting, in verse 8, Jerusalem is called Sodom and Egypt. That's how bad it gets. Well, it's like that now, but it's getting worse all the time. Now, the whole earth is excited because they didn't like these two prophets. These two prophets kept tormenting people. If you came and disagreed with their message, they just shot a little fire down and consumed you. So they were causing a few problems. And uh, so they're happy they're dead. Can't you see CNN reporting it? Hey, we got rid of those two aliens from outer space. But anyway, in verse 11 it says, After three days and a half, the Spirit of life from God entered into them, They stood upon their feet. Great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Now, you you can understand, can't you, the mid-tribulational view? They see the two witnesses as representing all the church-age believers. And they are resurrected, and they are asked to come up here. So they see that as the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians 4. By the way, this has a brand new application, uh, a book by Marv Rosenthal uh, called The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. You can buy it in any Christian bookstore. In his view, the day of the Lord, which is wrath, and he knows it to be so, that is just the last part of the last half. And so what he has is the rapture coming before the wrath hits, which solves one problem for him. And uh, he is kind of a similar mid-tribulational view, but with a little different touch. He doesn't care when the timing is. He just knows it's going to happen before the real plagues, the seven last plagues, he says, are called the wrath of the Almighty. And the other judgments, like the seals and the trumpets, are not necessarily that terrible wrath. I have a problem with that. I mean... Half the world is killed under the first judgments. That sounds pretty bad to me. But anyway, he's only concerned about the last seven, and that being uh, what he considers to be the day of the Lord's wrath. Now, there's a lot of views here. But there's another view that's kind of interesting that I happen to see on Christian television. Now, his theory was that when the Lord comes for his church, only spirit-filled believers are caught up. The carnal ones are left to go through the tribulation. Kind of like a Protestant purgatory, the way I saw it. Okay? (laughs) Behind all of these theories, folks, is a basic question. Will there be believers on earth during the tribulation? I think this is a rather simple question, but all the preachers on this are making this really hard. What's the answer to the question, Will there be believers on the earth during the tribulation? The answer is yes, of course there will be. Now, all those guys that are not pre-tribulational, they think they really have us now. Because if there are believers on earth during the tribulation, then how did you get the whole church moved to heaven? Well, the answer is, the believers are on earth during the tribulation come to know the Lord during the tribulation. And the fact of the matter is, they aren't a part of the church age at all. They're a part of the Old Testament age. They are the final week of Daniel's prophecy, the 70th week of Daniel. We're going to talk to you in detail about this, and it's going to really fascinate you in terms of what happens there. And you're going to actually have to become a pre-tribulationalist or figure that I'm wacko and out of my mind, which is another possibility. (laughs) You know, I could be just seen now, you know. So just to touch that a little bit more. Uh, first of all, dead believers won't be here. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I think we check our brains off at the door. People get in these arguments, and they don't even think of the obvious. You know, sometimes the most obvious things are very helpful. 
I don't know if this is a surprise to you, but the church is bigger in the area of those who have died than those that are living. Do you understand that? So if he's going to remove the whole church, and if the dead in Christ are going to rise, just let me clear something up. Dead believers, for sure, will not be on the earth during the tribulation. (laughs) Under anybody's view. Right? But if they're dead believers in the church age, then they're a part of the church. Oh, let me put it to you another way. Have you ever heard anybody say, um, I believe in the true church, the universal body of Christ on earth? Now, you got that basically from Catholicism. Because the Roman Catholic Church has taught that. Catholic meaning universal, Roman style meaning centered in Rome. And the Catholic Church principle is that there's one great church. Maybe different brand names, but we're all a part of the body of Christ on earth. I want to clear this up for you. To my knowledge, there is no universal church on earth at all. As a matter of fact, whenever God describes the church on earth, if he's referring to a city, it's singular. The church of Jerusalem, the church of Antioch, and so forth. But whenever it's bigger than a city, like a province, a district, a state, whatever, it's always plural, churches. Now, if there's only one universal church, then we can't have churches on earth. No, the truth of the matter is the universal body of Christ is being assembled in heaven. Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Hebrews chapter 12. All we have on earth is churches. And let's hope they're all believers. But you and I both know there's a lot of non-believers who are professing to be believers who are in the church. So those who are in the true church are those who are genuine believers in the Lord Jesus who when they die, that's when we'll really know whether they're in the church or not. Hello? You say, I beg your pardon, I've been a member of Methobacterianism for a long time. And I, no, 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 no. That's just your name in a church role, whatever. Uh, The important thing is to have your name enrolled in heaven in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm not against local churches, obviously. The Bible teaches that. We're to assemble together, hear the teaching of the Word, and uh, communion, all of that. I'm for all of that. I'm just saying, it's interesting that when we just shift our doctrine a hair, what sort of heresy down the line comes out from it. This ecumenicity on earth is not the teaching of the Bible. As a matter of fact, it warns us that that kind of ecumenicity leads to the false prophets rule in the last days, a world church. We better wake up. There's something wrong here. In Hebrews 12, it tells you about the true church. Verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, meaning the resurrection, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, Old Testament saints, and most importantly, and to Jesus, He's there too, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speak of better things than that of Abel, and on and on it goes. The point is, where's the church, the true church of the firstborn? The ones who really know the Lord, where is it? It's being assembled in heaven. There are more people in it than are in churches down here. You see, we need to understand, there's a group of believers who definitely will not be in the tribulation. Dead believers. So if the rapture occurs and we remove everyone, let's understand something. Those who believe that the church goes through the tribulation and raptured at the end uh, because of the problem of believers being on earth, well, it's not the total church, that's for sure, because dead believers will not be on earth during the tribulation. Is everybody okay so far? You say, hey, you've insulted us long enough. Please, move on. But I want to make sure you understand, because a lot of people... Get confused on that point alone. We completely ignore the fact that dead believers are in the church that is being assembled in heaven. And they will not be on the earth during the tribulation. By the way, there will be Jewish believers during the tribulation. We know, for instance, in Revelation chapter 7, there will be 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. The other day, a man who heard me teach on this said, well, they don't know... They lost the genealogical tables at the destruction of Jerusalem and nobody really knows who's a Jew anyway. Well, I knew right away he was a Gentile. (laughs) 
You know, we have the most amazing things that circulate among the Gentile Christians about Jews. I mean, it's, it's, it's mind-boggling to me. I spend half my time trying to straighten it out. It's, it's unbelievable what people believe. People say, well, they couldn't have a temple over there. They don't even know who the Levitical priests are. Well, you're only revealing your ignorance. They have a laser disc that has 28,000 names of Levitical priests on it. Oh, by the way, you know the Jews are supposed to live around those priests, right? The priests didn't have any land of their own. They were in charge of worship, and all the Jews are to live around them. So how would you find a Jewish community in any major city of the world? You'd look for the priests. You say, well, how do you find the priests? By looking up in the phone book at the name that means priest. What's the name that means priest? Cohen. C-O-H-E-N in English. Cohen. Just look for the Cohens and you will find the Jewish neighborhood. Hello? Did I give you a brilliant insight? Look for the Cohens. That's where the Jews live. Some of you are looking at me like, wow, that's... That's unbelievable. No, it's just a simple thing, folks. They know who the Levitical priests are. And you say, well, what if they're mixed up? Hey, please. God knows who they are. God's not confused. He knows what tribe you're from. Don't even worry about it. God's in complete control of this whole thing. You say, well, what about intermarriage? God can straighten it out. Now, the Jews are having a hard time straightening it out. For instance, my wife, she could go and live in Israel without any question. Walk right in, become a resident, no questions asked. Why? Because she has a Jewish mother and she has a Jewish grandmother. And you see today, that's what the Jewish law courts are demanding. That you prove your mother was Jewish and your grandmother was Jewish. They used to say just mother, but now they're so upset at all the kids that are getting in there. They're saying now we'll make it, you've got to have a grandmother that's Jewish also and prove it. Now, I couldn't even get in there. My dad's Jewish, but my mother is a Gentile. So in their view, I'm ruled out. But in God's Bible, I'm not ruled out. As a matter of fact, God doesn't trace the line to the women. Sorry, gals. But he doesn't do it. He traces it to the men. That's why we have Gentile women in the Messianic line. And if you bring that up to modern Israelis, they don't want to deal with it. We say, wait a minute, how in the world can you believe this when you actually would have the Jewish line cut off in terms of the Messiah because there were Gentile women in the line? Like Rahab the harlot, they don't want to hear it. Uh, Bathsheba, the wife of the, Uriah the Hittite. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Shua who married a Canaanite who married Judah. You've got Tamar. I mean, you've got a mess. You've got Ruth who's a Moabitess. They're all in the Messianic line. So God traces the line through men, not through women. But see, Jews are confused about that, and they don't know who's a Jew and who isn't a Jew. I get various magazines, Jewish magazines and papers, and they're always discussing this issue. Who's a Jew? They're worried about assimilation, intermarriage, all of that. Let me just clear something up for you. God is not confused. Paul said he is a Jew is not one simply outwardly in the flesh, but one inwardly in the heart. Circumcision of flesh, yes, it's a sign of your belief in the Abrahamic covenant. But if you don't have a circumcised heart, you're not in, brother, no matter what you say. Is everybody listening? It's very important. Are there going to be Jewish believers on earth during the tribulation? Yes, 144,000 of them, at least. Now, I think there's going to be a lot more. But there's at least that many because this group will will not be killed. They're going to be sealed by God, protected by God, and nobody will be able to kill them. And they're going to take the everlasting gospel over the whole world during the tribulation period. And that, I believe, is the reason why we'll have a multitude of Gentile believers coming to know the Lord. Because these people are going to be able to take it to every last tongue, says Revelation 14. But there are over 3,000 dialects that have yet to receive one verse of Scripture in their own language. No problem. They will have the ability to speak in every language of the world. Why should you be surprised at that? When the church age began, we had that on the day of Pentecost. And Peter quoted from the book of Joel and said, This is that which was spoken by Joel. When the Holy Spirit was poured out on him, they spoke and every man heard in his dialect in which he was born. Why couldn't 144,000 Jews also speak in every language of the world and thus God fulfill His promise? Now, some of you are saying, boy, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Hey, we're just getting started. There's more stuff coming. 
More stuff coming. Now, we do know, if you'll turn to Revelation 7, that there are a multitude of Gentiles who will come to know the Lord in the tribulation. I do not believe they're they're the church, and I will be explaining to you why. But those who are post-tribulationists, this is their major point. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this, after speaking of the 144,000 Jews, they're not Jehovah Witnesses, they're Jews. (laughs) After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and what? Tongues, languages stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice. Notice they're already resurrected. Apparently they're going to be killed. Cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, cherubim, four worship leaders in heaven, living creatures, and they fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. He that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. Neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. Apparently they've suffered greatly during the tribulation. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, shall lead them unto living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Isn't that a wonderful passage? It's talking about Gentiles, because it says nations, goyim, Gentiles, Gentile believers, and so many of them, you can't number them. The biggest revival, evangelistic crusade ever in the history of the world will be during the tribulation. A multitude of Gentiles out of every nation, tribe, tongue, and people are going to come to know the Lord during this awful period of time. Okay, now we're ready for the message. All of this has been introduction. I want to give you seven lines of proof that the second coming of Christ, in particular the rapture of the church, occurs before the tribulation ever begins. And the first one we'll just get started on right now. Number one is the purpose of the day of the Lord. The purpose of the tribulation period. What is the purpose of the tribulation period? The post-trib looks at it, as I said, like a Protestant purgatory where God is going to purge His people and purify a people for Himself. And they have some verses they use to prove that point. There's not any clear evidence of their view whatsoever. As a matter of fact, something quite contradictory to their view. What is the purpose of the day of the Lord? Now, to be accurate so we all follow it, we're going to break this down into four areas. First of all, as it relates to Israel, what is the purpose? Then as it relates to the whole world, all the Gentiles in the world, and as it relates to God Himself, and also as it relates to the church. Okay? Everybody with me? That's where we're going. Those of you who are taking notes, all Spirit-filled believers take notes. Many of you probably are concluding, you know, I'm just nothing but carnal sitting here trying to listen. I know some people don't like to take notes. They love to listen. Okay, here we go. First of all, as it relates to the nation of Israel, what is the purpose of the day of the Lord, the tribulation period? Interesting question. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 30. Why do we have this period of time called the Great Tribulation? Jeremiah chapter 30. Verse 7. There are three purposes as it relates to the nation of Israel. Three of them. Number one we're looking at now is to chasten them. 
You know, when I talk to my Jewish friends about this, it is not an easy conversation. Why? Because the Jews have been chastened all the way through history, very severely. You know, the Bible says that Israel is a chosen nation out of all the nations of the world. You know what Jews say? Why doesn't he choose somebody else? We've had enough trouble. Do you think they like being the chosen nation? No, they don't like it at all. Now, in order for God to clarify to all peoples of the world which group he was talking about, he gave them a special diet. We call it kosher, which means clean. He gave them a special diet. What is the purpose of the day of the Lord as it relates to Israel? It's to chasten them. They don't want to hear that. They're tired of being a chosen nation. They're tired of having that dumb diet. That's why the Jews just forsake it. Eat whatever they want. A little bacon with your eggs? Who cares? Pig is not big in Jerusalem. You understand? You know when McDonald's went to Jerusalem and put an establishment there, they're not dumb. It's not called McDonald's. It's called McDavid's. That's true in Jerusalem. And there's no pork there, let me tell you something. They couldn't even get the right to exist. You understand, we're, we're all a little fuzzy on this. It's for Jewish people. God separated them from all nations of the world. Why? Because He wants to deal with them so that all of us learn what kind of a God He is. He will be faithful to them no matter what their disobedience. Will He chasten them and judge them? Yes. And the worst is coming. Jews don't want to hear that. They believe the Holocaust was the worst. Six million Jews killed. In the name of Christianity, by the way, I've had, I got tons of quotes of Adolf Hitler. He, he, he manifested himself among the Christians to be a Christian. And he told them he was doing the will of God. He made them believe that Jews killed Jesus. Listen, the ones who crucified him were Romans. I don't hear any Italians being called Christ killers. This is a real strange thing. I'll tell you what put him on a cross. God did. His, his plan. The Bible says so. The predetermined counsel of God put him on a cross. And if you want to know about the human involvement, it's your sin and mine that put him on a cross, whether you're Jewish or Gentile. And if you want to know about that mob that cried crucified him, it was a set-up mob by the Jewish Sanhedrin, a wicked, corrupt priesthood. Read your Bible carefully. The common people heard Jesus gladly. They were the ones proclaiming Him to be Messiah that very same week. But a mob violence started and they started yelling out. And the chief priests and scribes were behind it. You want to blame somebody, blame them. But stop blaming Jewish people. The Bible says He came unto His own, His own received Him not. Well, how many Gentile nations has a message come to and they didn't receive it? We don't jump all over their neck. You understand Jewish people have a hard time listening to the Christian message because in the name of Christianity, they've lost thousands of their people. Killed, martyred, tortured. One of the greatest preachers of the early church, Chrysostom, called Golden Mouth because of his fantastic preaching in the 4th century A.D. He said the Jews are fit for nothing else than to be butchered like pigs. This is supposed to be a great man of God? Listen, folks, you don't know how Jews have suffered. So for me to get up here and say, you know, the purpose of the day of the Lord is to chasten Israel. I have a very sensitive heart to that. I don't want to say that. But I know what the Bible says. The worst judgment ever to come on the nation of Israel is about to happen. Jeremiah 30, are you there? I gave you time to turn. <laughs> Verse 7. Alas, he says, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, shall be in rest, and be quiet, none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Now watch this carefully. Though I make a full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet will I not make a full end of thee. 
but I will correct thee in measure and will not leave thee altogether unpunished. Is God going to judge them? Is he going to chasten them? Yes, he certainly is. Turn to the book of Amos, please. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos. And look at chapter 3. Amos chapter 3. The purpose of the day of the Lord, the tribulation, as it relates to the nation of Israel, is to chasten them. Amos 3, verse 1. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Go over to chapter 9 of Amos. And look at verse 8 and 9. Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from off the face of the earth, saving that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, saith the Lord. He won't do it completely. For lo, I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among all nations, like as corn is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. Is God going to chasten them? Yes, He certainly is. Go to Zechariah, please, right before the last book of the Old Testament, the Italian prophet, Malachi. Go to Zechariah chapter 13. And look, please, at verse 8 and 9. You talk about chastening Israel? Look at this. It shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts, 66 and two-thirds percent of the Jewish population, Two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. I'll bring the third part through the fire. We'll refine them as silver is refined. We'll try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name and I will hear them. I will say it is my people. And they shall say the Lord is my God. God is going to chasten them. Look at the last book, Malachi chapter 3. Some verses that are quoted in the New Testament. Malachi chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Behold, I'll send my messenger. He, he shall prepare the way before me. That was John the Baptist, as you know from the New Testament. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. But who may abide the day of his coming? Who shall stand when he appeareth? For he's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver. That they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Verse 6. For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. You see, the unchangeableness of God always refers to his promise to Israel. That Israel will always survive in spite of the many attempts to destroy her. Do you remember in Matthew 24, Jesus said, This generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And what do we do? We say, well, a generation is like 40 years, because when Israel was in the wilderness, God called them that generation. Or we say, well, maybe it's 70 or 80 years, like the Psalms say, the generation of a man's life. Or maybe it's talking about until you have your first child, because then that's the second generation. And on and on it goes, people trying to figure out the date of the Lord's coming. They miss the whole passage. The passage is a quotation from Jeremiah 31. The generation, genios in Greek, is a race of people. He's talking about the survival of Israel. This generation of people, this race of people, will never pass away till all of this be fulfilled. Why is that an important statement? Because he said there'll be great tribulation. So awful that if it would be possible, if those days wouldn't be shortened, even the elect wouldn't be saved. He's not talking about the church. He's talking about Israel, the elect, the chosen of God. They are going to survive the tribulation even though it looks like they will not. The Bible says all nations will be gathered against Jerusalem. And the Bible says that Jerusalem will be taken, that city. The women raped. It says there will be slaughter and death. And just when it looks like Israel will be wiped off the face of the earth, something all Islamic nations are committed to. And when it looks like it's going to happen... At that moment, the Messiah will return. The Bible says the Lord will defend His people and the Lord will destroy all nations that came against her. Believest thou this? We're talking the word of the Lord here. And it's going to happen. What's the purpose of the day of the Lord, the tribulation? To chasten Israel. So that they will see their need of the Lord. 
Why does God bring problems into your life? So that you will see your need of the Lord. Why does your marriage fall apart? Why are your kids going bonkers? Why is there so much drug? Why is there alcohol? Why is all this happening? Well, there are many reasons, of course, that are rooted in our sinful nature and depravity. But one of the things we often ignore is the purpose of God chastening, leading us to see our need of Him. How much does it take for you to get your eyes on the Lord? How much does it take? But there's something else that is the purpose of God towards the nation of Israel, and that's to cast out the rebels and the unbelievers. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 20. Are there unbelievers in Israel? Boy, there sure are. I've spent a lot of time with them too. There's a lot of unbelievers. One of the premiers of Israel lost an election because he told the people he didn't believe in God and didn't think the Bible had anything to do with Israel. Are there unbelievers in Israel? Oh, yes. In Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 34, I will bring you out from the people, will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, with fury poured out. I will bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there will I plead with you face to face, like as I pleaded with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt. So will I plead with you, saith the Lord God, and I'll cause you to pass under the rod, and I'll bring you into the bond of the covenant. And I will purge out from among you the rebels, And them that transgress against me, I will bring them forth out of the countries where they sojourn, and they shall not enter into the land of Israel. You shall know that I am the Lord. God's going to change things. You talk about uh, Aaliyah, uh, which is referring to being able to go back to Israel. You talk about immigration problems. Listen, the Lord's going to see to it the future. The land of Israel in the millennium is going to be composed of His people who love Him. The rebels will be purged out. So what's the purpose of the day of the Lord towards Israel? To chasten them so they'll see their need of the Lord. To cast out rebels and unbelievers. And the third one I've already mentioned, that's to cause them to know the Lord. To cause them to know the Lord. Turn to Ezekiel chapter 39. Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes an invasion of Gog and Magog. Some believe that's Russia attacking Israel before the tribulation. Some say during the tribulation. Some say after the tribulation. Some say after the millennium. My personal view is that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is the same as all the rest of the Hebrew prophets. It's talking about the tribulation. It's talking about the battle of Armageddon. I know there are good men who disagree, including myself. Years ago, I disagreed with myself. But I believe myself to be wrong, and uh, I have a lot of reasons for that. In Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 8 and 9. Behold, it is come, it is done, saith the Lord God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth and shall set on fire, burn the weapons, both the shields and the bucklers, the bows, the arrows, the hand staves, the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. That's why some people believe that this will happen before the tribulation because you wouldn't want to be burning during a millennium. Uh, I don't have a problem with that, but some people do. Verse 22, so the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. How could it be before the tribulation when there will be unbelievers in Israel during the tribulation? Therefore, the verse is out of context. Do you understand? Read it again. The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. I don't believe this happens before the tribulation. I think it happens at the end of the tribulation, the battle of Armageddon. But anyway, verse 28 and 29, Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God. Favorite phrase in Ezekiel, that they shall know that I am the Lord their God, which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more there. Neither will I hide my face any more from them, for I have poured out my Spirit upon the house of Israel. But according to Zechariah, that doesn't happen until the end of the tribulation. So you see there are a lot of reasons why I can't fit this passage, as some do, Uh, before the tribulation. I don't think so. I think it's Armageddon. Now, as it relates to the nation of Israel, the purpose of the day of the Lord is to chasten them, to cast out the rebels and unbelievers, and to cause them to know the Lord. What about the nations of the world? What's the purpose of God? Are you still in Ezekiel 39? Of course you are. Amen? Verse 21. Verse 21. I will set my glory among the heathen, the nations, and all the heathen or nations shall see my judgment that I have executed and my hand 
that I have laid upon them. The first thing, as it relates to the nations of the world, the purpose of the tribulation is to demonstrate God's holiness, wrath, and judgment. To demonstrate God's holiness, wrath, and judgment. In the book of Joel, Hosea, Joel, in chapter 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, For behold, in those days and in that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations, bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Verse 11, Assemble yourselves and come, all you heathen, all you nations. Gather yourselves together round about. Thither cause thy mighty ones to come down, O Lord. Let the heathen, the nations, be wakened. Come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there will I sit to judge all the heathen, all the nations round about. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come get you down, the press is full, the vats overflow, their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. This is not a harvest crusade. This is a judgment of God upon the nations who come against Jerusalem. The sun and the moon shall be darkened. The stars shall withdraw their shining. The Lord also shall roar out of Zion, utter His voice from Jerusalem. The heavens of the earth shall shake, but the Lord will be the hope of His people and the strength of the children of Israel. My dear friends, According to the Bible, one of the purposes of God in the tribulation toward the nations of the world is to demonstrate His holiness, His wrath, and His judgment. Turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. I know this is getting a little thick, and maybe you're struggling a bit. Revelation 6, 9 and 10. Here's what it says. When He opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the Word of God, and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with, a loud, cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? My dear friends, God is going to judge the nations of the world during the tribulation. Turn over to chapter 19. There's going to be a big praise gathering in heaven when the nations of the world are destroyed by God, by the, whole, the, the Messiah who comes, the Holy One of Israel. In Revelation 19, verse 1 and 2, here's what it says. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power unto the Lord our God. Why? For true and righteous are His judgments. For He hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of of his servants at her hand. The ancient Hebrew prophets asked the question, why do the righteous suffer and the wicked prosper? Haven't you asked that? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why do evil people get away with it? Well, let's clear that up. Nobody gets away with anything. Payday someday. Be sure your sin will find you out. You either deal with it now and confess and acknowledge it, or the Lord will deal with it. It's very, very important to understand that. What's going to happen in the tribulation towards the nation of the world, God is not only going to demonstrate His holiness and wrath and judgment, He's going to destroy them. We will have no national understanding of the nations that are currently associated with the United Nations anymore. They're going to be destroyed as national entities. All their armies that came against Jerusalem are going to be destroyed. The land of Israel will be a great wine press, and the Messiah will tramp out their blood to the point it'll flow up to horses' bridles. It is going to be the most awful judgment the world has ever seen. We call it Armageddon. And by the way, it will be one against the world. The Messiah says, I'm going to do it all alone. I don't need any help. You know what else he's going to do? He's going to divide them up into blessing and judgment on the basis of how they treated Israel. We read in Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 to 46, the judgment of the nations. Some are called sheep and some are called goats. The sheep go into the kingdom, the goats go into everlasting fire. And what's the basis of the judgment? How they have treated His people. You know, God meant what He said long ago when He said, I will bless them who bless thee and I will curse him who curseth thee. My wife's family was Jewish. 
as I said, my dad was Jewish, but he married a Gentile. Her dad was not only a Gentile, but he hated Jews and believed it was God's will to kill him and tried to kill my dad. And in a great outburst, damning the Jews and wanting to kill them, I guess God thought that was it. He died, went home to be with the Lord. Nasser, I hope he went home to be with the Lord. He claimed to be a Christian. Nasser of Egypt said he was going to drive every last Jew into the Mediterranean shortly after he died. God meant what he said. I will bless them who bless you and curse him who curses you. That doesn't justify everything Jews do. Not at all. But God meant what he said. He's very serious about it. And how you treat the people of Israel, how you treat Jewish people, is very much on the mind of God. He can't take his eyes off of them. He watches them every day and night. Never sleeps. He calls himself the shepherd of his people. And you love to quote it about yourself, don't you? But we forget that he's the shepherd of Israel and said so over and over again. Be very careful what you say. Now, there's also a purpose of the tribulation as it relates to God himself. What is God doing in the tribulation? Well, we've already got it. Leviticus 38, 23 tells us again, he's declaring his own glory, how great he is. But you know what else he's doing? He's demonstrating his love for his people Israel and his faithfulness to his promises. Because in the tribulation, it's going to look like it won't happen. They're going to wipe them out. But God will show them that he'll never go back on his word. And he will rescue them and deliver them. Now, got one more thing before the break. What is the purpose of the tribulation toward the church? Are you ready? It's going to take a lot of writing. Nothing. Nothing. All the sermons you've heard about the church going through the tribulation, they make it up. There are no references. What is the purpose of the church going through the tribulation? Answer, nothing. God doesn't have a purpose. Could it possibly be, hold on, could it possibly be that the reason is that the church will not be here? Hello? More about this later. Let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your wonderful word. And help us, Lord, to continue to be good students searching it to see whether these things are so. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.